Thank you for coming tonight for the Lahu Oko'a presentation. Um, this presentation is actually a part of the Kekaulike grant that is a collaboration between UH Manoa and UH Maui. And the uh, uh, main goal of the grant is to encourage um, transfer from UH Maui to Oko'a. So we're really happy to have some of our colleagues here um, and excited for what's going to happen. Um, I'm going to introduce Jamaica Osorio, who is um, going to do a poem for us, and then she's going to introduce everybody else. Okay, it's the big one. Um, and this poem is uh, this poem is my response to trying to articulate uh, the history of Hawaiian activism and resistance in our culture, which is kind of relevant in talking about independence and standing apart. Um, there's going to be a part of this poem where you probably think you should stand up. Don't worry about standing up. We'll all stand up at the end. There's, you'll see why. Oh, I should stand up and sing this. You can sing, absolutely sing, but don't stand up because the poem's seven minutes long. You will be standing for seven minutes. That's really awkward. Cool? All right. I'm just going to talk really loud because I hate this. Talk loud. It's 1872, and David Clarko, not yet crowned, not yet anointed or king, penned the song at the request of Kamehameha the Fifth. Lota Kapuaiwa. Hawaii Ponohi. A new national anthem a new symbol of strength, a new promise to the Kanakamoli of Kalakaua's generation that like those before, they will stand and fight for their right to noho alpuni. Today, we call this resistance. Back then, we just called it pono. Writes, we sing of a generation of Kanakaboli and Kamaka and Anamoe that gave their fierce bodies for this legacy. We sing and we remember we are the sons and daughters of Paul, the deepest, darkest, most creative forces in this world. We sing and we remember Umi Ali Loa Kihapi Ilani Manono Kekuo Kalani Hawaiians who practice strength, resiliency, and resistance, knowing that no human power was so supreme that it could not or should not be overturned when unjust. Kalakabo writes and remembers an older Kamehameha, Kauki Keuli, thundering. Kalakaua holds this declaration in his evening and pushes it through his melodies like we have been taught to hold it in our bloodline and cradle it on our tongues, keep it sacred and safe from the poison fingertips of this fake state. It is 1893. A nation in distress, an overthrown kingdom, and Ellen Kohiboka like Prendigras feeds her generation rocks of resistance. Pens us the melodic reminder of our genealogy of protest, and Kalui Ko'olo and his wife run through the brush at Kalolo on Kauai. Their steps are heavy yet precise because they know the weight of a generation shrouding their shoulders. They realize the power from which they resist when they refuse to be wrongfully imprisoned by his sickness. And there is no regret in this resistance. So when P.E. Lunny, his wife, buries him, it is her tears that return his body and rifle to dust. His generation's ihe and answers. <laughs> Na kawa e pale, me ka e. It's January 7, 1895. 300 men led by Robert Wilcox take cover in the pohaku above Leahi. With the rifles armed with gunpowder and aloha aina, untrained soldiers give their lives for Hawaii. These are not the core of the key who, who reign of Waimea. They are the only last they are only the last physical defense of a people who know in their na'o that laying down to the opposition is not an option. Though they are not Ihe, not Ma'u, not Ma'a, they are the Kowa who answer Kalakau's call. And so now it's 1897. 
When America's physical power seems to be a muscle that cannot be matched, Kanakamoli of this generation take to the greatest weapon of a new time, pen and paper. Because of them, our Kapuna's names are made scratched into a new kind of stone, painting the picture of a strong, unified people, a nation whose love for Aina and Mahui could not be rivaled, erased, or buried under joint resolution. <laughs> It is January 3rd, 1976. After almost six decades of mourning, nine young Kanakamoli galvanized by the resistance to Kalama Valley evictions land on the island of Koholabe. Kohemala Malama O Kanawa. They have come to heal an island torn by the bombs of someone else's war for someone else's security. On that day, the Protekko Olave Ohana re reignited the fight of Aloha Aina so powerful it defeated the largest military in the world. But between March 6th and 7th of 1977, George Helm and Kimo Mitchell, two members of the Protekko Olave Ohana, were taken. Their sacrifice reminds us what we must be willing to offer back to our Lahui, that sometimes we do not return on our own two feet. Sometimes we are only a song, the faint memory of a sweet melody. Sometimes we are just the mo'olelo for the next generation to carry. Now it is 2015. Those of us who remain have the kuleana of their lessons, like 2016, those of us who remain have the kuleana of their lessons laced into the backbone of our practice so that they shall never be forgotten. Hawaii Pono e Kalahu e O Kau Hananui e Uye. This is an anthem of resistance written from the memories of past promises on March 29, 2015. Aloha Aina of this generation ascended our sacred Mauna Awakea. They have stayed through the night protecting our sacred people in the courtrooms and in the front lines for years. Their sacrifice confirms resistance of Hawaiian tradition. Aipohaku as fundamental to our story as Hula and Oli. This is the true Mo'olalo Hawai'i. New roots sprouting from old seeds. E na po'eo Hawai'i. Oni pa'a in this resistance, knowing that your kupuna, Robert Wilcox, Lilio Kalani, Ellen Keohivo Kalani, Wright Prendergrass, George Helm, Kimo Mitchell, and the hundreds and thousands who joined with them would stand with our brothers and sisters between any Mona and any desecration. We stand on their shoulders today when we insist on a better future. We honor their names. So come, Eku'i Luna, let us sing. Know that when you do, you are joining the hundreds and thousands who sang these songs before you. Know in your na'o that this is the way we rise.
for being here tonight. Um, as you know, we are here to prematurely uh, celebrate Lakota Kukua, to learn a little bit more about this thing, this national Hawaiian holiday, our Independence Day, um, and maybe learn a little bit about how, how it's so much more than the way that Americans celebrate their Independence Day. Um, so to lead us on this journey tonight, um, and share some olelo about what Kuokoa is historically and what it can be today. Uh, we have three wonderful panelists who I will introduce and then get out of the way. Uh, each of them will share a bit about um, their own understanding of this holiday and also just the idea of Kuokoa, of independence, of sovereignty, of ea. Um And then at the end, there will be time for questions or comments or conversations. So um, if things come up for you that are really uh, generative, feel free to write them down and throw it back at them at the end, that would be really great. Um, first, we have the brilliant Donovan Puhio Collops, who um, is who I claim as Ohana, found, found his Ohana, we found each other's Ohana in our genealogies uh, a few years ago, um, as Ohana from Maui and Hawaii Island. His mother is here in the second row. Uh, so you guys can all thank her for his um, Donovan is a published poet, a fantastic fiction writer and a PhD candidate in English at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and with that, a fantastic instructor of English. Um, really, he actually is the instructor of many of our Native Hawaiian students. We kind of throw them towards him in his classes, and he does a really great job with them. Uh, today, Donovan will be talking about Ha'alilio. Um, Donovan's done some archival research about this man who went on the journey to receive recognition for our um, for our nation in 1843. Um, next, we will have Ili Malong, who is a faculty member at Native Hawaiian Student Services, um, a PhD candidate in Indigenous Politics at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, uh, mother to the amazing Pahele, not that Pahele, another Pahele, um, uh, and a fantastic friend and fellow activist. Um, so give both of them a round of applause. And, and, and a long time. And a long time. And a long I'm the only one up here who has no Ohana from this island. And then of course we have Clay Kuokaeo, who you guys I'm sure already know. Um, he's tired already. Um, they're tired of listening to him. Um, we were joking up there that for his bio we should say that he's the guy you call if you need someone to get arrested on the front lines. He will show up for you. Um, he will go all nine yards. So um, please give a round of applause to our panelists. Can you guys hear me if I just speak no, you, like this? You have to use it. Like I don't have to use it. Oh my god. Aloha. Aloha. Mahalo Kikalike, Mahalo Jamaica, Mahalo Kahale, Mahalo Kum Kaleko, Mahalo Yu. Um, oh, um, I have um, some small makanas uh, for you guys. Um, uh, it's a little, they call it a daguerreotype photo. Um, of Timoteo Ha'alilio, taken in 1843. My uh, Don Mahi is, has seen them out. Oh. Um, oh. Wana. Yeah. Um, I also, I also have, in the back table, I have some printouts. But, well, it's a, one of the most republished Kaniko for uh, Timoteo Ha'alilio. Um, and it's back there. Um, feel free to take some. If we run out and you want one, just let me know and I can email it to you. Or um, actually, I can email you the actual new paper that it comes from. Um, um, and the reason why I kind of printed this out because I started, um, I started becoming really interested in Ha'alilio. Mahalo Dan. Um, and I went into the archives to try to find him, and uh, I had a lot of days where I was just crying in the archives, reading his letters, reading letters from his mother, from his wife, from Kekuanoa. Uh, um, uh, and it's a good thing they have the plastic covers over the letters, because I would have them. Uh, um, but I kept this in my wallet for at least almost going on two years now, I forgot it was in there, so I, if, like, two weeks before I came here, I realized I had it, and uh, it was a, I don't know, it was just a good reminder, and 
I don't know, I like the feeling of having a video close to my now. Um, but anyway, these are yours. Take, take as many as you want. Um, I have any plenty. Um, plus, it'll distract from my disorganized kind of story today. Uh, I don't really know where to start. Um, I'm not done. This is not a finished project at all. Um, but I think I can just start with maybe the basic kind of narrative that we hear about what La uh, Kuukua is, um, what was accomplished, who accomplished it. And then I'd like to share some of the EK that I found in the archives. Letters. Letters written in Ola Hawaii by Timoteo Audio by his social network. Um, after spending so much time in the archive, I I liken it to like old school social media. Like, it's like the old school social network of Artipuna. Um From anything as personal to like a picture of their cat, but you know what I mean. But like to like more global kinds of concerns and like political uh, strategies and you know behind the scenes kind of stuff. It's all there, just waiting. Um, so I thought I'd jump in and out of my essay um, and, and, and then you know maybe talk story a little bit and read some read some of the excerpts from these letters. Oh, but first, okay. So very very simplified kind of narrative. Um, La Kuko, official holiday celebrating the day when England and France officially recognize Hawaii independence. And I think I, I, I have a strong feeling that Inima and Kubukuleko uh, will kind of unpack that word recognized or recognition um, maybe a little bit. Um, no pressure, but. Um, <laughs> uh, Inima will take care of that one. So um, there are many problems in the Hawaiian Kingdom preceding and during uh, this kind of quest to go and uh, secure independence recognition. But arguably, one of the most primary concerns for Komoli, Kauhi was um, this, this, con this foreign encroachment and this kind of threatening behavior um, towards Hawaiian territory. Specifically, French Cyril, French Captain Cyril Laplace in 1839, and during Leo and Richard's mission in 1842-43, um, George Paulet, the British captain. Okay. So Kauai Kioli thought it was necessary to send his most trusted advisors to the US, to England, to the UK, Belgium, France, to secure Hawaiian independence. So that's 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 the narrative that I knew first when I discovered, oh, we have Independence Day. Um, but my project is kind of diving into the archives to find how to deal uh, the Ali'i, the Congregationalist, um, the advisor, um, just to see you know, what kind of mommy and depths that I can find um, for him. So you have the picture, right? You have that bigger okay? So I'm gonna start with that picture. The expression on his face is a blend of determination and concern. And a shadow casts over the left side of his body, chiseling his cheek. Perhaps he knew he would never see his one and now again. But perhaps he had no idea that almost a full year after the light etched his features, posing in front of that white wall, that he would pass away off the coast of New York. He was almost home. This original daguerreotype photograph of Timoteo Kamalehua Ha'alilio, taken in Paris, France, is kept in the archives of the Hawaiian Mission Houses in Honolulu. It is the first photograph of its kind that takes a native Hawaiian as its subject. So just a little side note, this is the garotype, right? It's a, it's a new technological feat that appeared in Paris in 1843, the same time Ha'alilio and Richards was there, William Richards. 
the same year that Pablo arrived, and the camera's ability to capture a new level of realism sparked resulted in resulted in a rapid growth of the erotic portrait industry. So I thought this was a really cool moment to see our kupuna, our aliki, like embedded in these like I don't know um, really exciting moments in world history too. He sits on a chair, or perhaps a stool, at the end of a table with his right arm resting on his lap, just below his dark European-styled coat. His left arm leans on a hardcover book placed at the edge of the table. The year is 1843, when the unknown photographer begins the intricate process of exposing Pabalilio's body, his eyes, to the polished silver plate hidden in the newly invented box camera. One of the most iconic figures of Native Hawaiian sovereignty, Timoteo Komelehua Ha'alilio, served and lived as an elite with multiple roles during a pivotal time in Hawaii's history, when increasingly persistent encounters with European and American foreigners began to change the ways the Hawaiian kingdom structured its government, specifically between the years 1839 and 45. Um, side note, the 1839 Declaration of Rights the 1840 Constitution, the 1843 Recognition of Independence, and the 1845 Island-wide Petitions that asked the Hawaiian government to stop placing in, uh, in uh, official positions of power are key moments that frame the complex social-political atmospheres of the first non-European nation to achieve sovereignty during the height of Western imperialism in the 19th century. Although it is difficult to determine the exact date of this photograph, it is certain that Holly Leo and his diplomatic partner, the former American missionary William Richards, mission to secure independence recognition for the Hawaiian Kingdom on November 28, 1843, was a success. Another fact, after almost two centuries since Hawaii's independence was recognized by England, France, and the United States, there is still not one book or one considerably lengthy text dedicated to Ha'alilio that addresses the what's and how's of his achievements when Kauli Keoli sent him and Richards on their clandestine mission on July 18, 1842, to secure sovereignty on behalf of Alahui, increasingly under threat by foreign warships harboring her shores. Ha'alilio was Hawaii's first diplomat and a legendary Hawaiian patriot who worked literally unto his death to secure Hawaiian independence recognition. A few excerpts do exist about his contributions to the Hawaiian Kingdom's independence, ranging from a paragraph to several pages and book chapters to Wikipedia entries and personal blogs. But as more scholars of Hawaiian history acknowledge and make their ways towards the immense ocean of paper, that is the largest indigenous language archive in the United States, a vast matrix of archival currents that travel and flow through times, lives, and places, not just throughout Hawaii, but also throughout the world. There is hope that these researches will bring the complex past of Hawaii's histories to the present. The archival researchings of this essay work towards braiding the sentiment that Ha'alilio repeats in his letters um, to his loved ones, to William Richards, he always says, Ko kawa kaapale lo ihiana, our long separation. And I liken that separation between him and his aina, between him and his wife and his mother and his family, to our separation from our history um, and how we can remedy that. Um, so, um, oh, before I go on, one more thing about the archive, right? If I go on. So, if scholars of Hawaiian history, especially Kanaka Maui scholars of Hawaiian history, can begin to view these primary sources as more than just pieces of paper, but rather as kinds of textual kupuna, in and of themselves, perhaps the rather paralyzing dichotomy of orality versus writing will shift into new spaces that construct multiple points of entry into understanding notions like identity today. Um, okay, so, um, July 18th, 1842. 
Ha'ililu and William Richards at the Kaua of Kaui Keoli depart from Lahaina on their long and initially clandestine mission. Kaui Keoli did not want to alert um, colonial powers. They had eyes everywhere. So instead of sailing around Cape Horn, um, Ha'ililu and Richards were instructed to go to Mexico first and to walk through and then from the Gulf, go up through the Gulf and head towards DC. <laughs> they rode on mules, they walked. Um, I have seen Richard's journal and the parts where he gets really messy with his handwriting, I'm wondering if he's riding on a mule. Uh, it was, when I think about, when I think about that trip, I mean, they were starving, there was a lot of times when they couldn't eat. They made it. They made it all the way. And there's a lot of other stuff too that goes on, goes on um, with their trip. Um, so once they arrive on the southwest coast of North, North America, they travel by foot, sometimes via donkey through Mexico, ultimately reaching the Gulf. From there, they take a steamer to DC. And on the steamer, Halilio was mistaken as Richard's uh, servant. And um, there's a really cool moment, I think. Um, I think because Richards, Richards corrected the, the, the officer of the, of the steamboat um, and said, no, this is, in, in SNT, he was kind of saying, no, I'm his servant. Um, and their relationship, too, is, is, is really uh, complicated and interesting. Um, so, they stay with England and Belgium and France after DC. So this is the general narrative, right? That services in or around Kalapuokoa, when his name, Halilu's name and accomplishments are increasingly and rightly honored and remembered, put, to put back together. But what more can we learn about Halilu and the complexities of his diplomatic mission beyond these important, but brief moments of yearly remembrances? And besides that fact, I mean, I only found out about this Independence Day maybe less than 10 years ago. Um, in 1895, uh, Lahuakua was banned as an official holiday and um, Thanksgiving was turned into the official holiday. Yeah, 1895. But what did the archives reveal between the ge geographical markers of his mission, right? So what does it reveal between Lahaina, Mexico, DC, England, France, Belgium? Where is Halilio? So that was kind of my, um, my, my interest. Um, where do the archives reveal him between the rigor of foreign diplomacy meetings and formalities, between the legislative records of official correspondences across continents and oceans? Where is Ha'alilio the Oniginui in those strange and new lands? Where is Ha'alilio the devout congregationalist? Because he was. Where is he the son? Where is the husband? What can we infer while he ponders every inked kuo olelo that sails back and forth to him from his ainahana? So, um, I'll, I'll start with a letter from his, his, um, his wife. Uh, her name was um, Hannah Hooper, um, but I think she went by Hannah Hooper. Uh, towards the end of the letter, sent from Honolulu, that Honolulu receives from his wife while he is staying in London. So this is March 13th, 1843, to Honolulu. My dear husband, I am in receipt of your letters and I am much pleased with them and to know that you are well. We are all well, no one being sick. And that was usually, to say that no one was being sick, that was usually the very first line to let somebody know, right? Yeah, we're okay, we're okay, we're not sick, right? We don't have any illnesses. I am quite well at this writing. Your nephew is also very well. The following are some of the things which have happened here recently. An English warship came into port and the commander refused to recognize Kekuanaoa, 
who was the governor of Oahu. When some of the foreigners with Judd, this is Jared P. Judd, called on the warship, the officers sent them away saying, we, don't, we do not know you. Paulette wanted to talk to Cohen Cody directly, but it wasn't happening. <laughs> Kaui Keoli was sent for and he came to town. The commander did not come ashore, but sent word that if war was to be had, his warship was ready. All the women who were English were taken aboard of an English boat, and the boat, and the boat was sent out to be anchored outside of the harbor. The British flag had been hoisted over these islands and the Hawaii's flag lowered. The warship is still here. An American vessel is also here. I cannot enumerate all the things that took place. When I saw Kawi Keoli and John Young, I imagined you were with you. they were with you and the one who wanted you to go and help this cause. When Kawi Keoli saw me, he wept. We are still here with our mother. She came to see her foster child, Nanai Kikina, Kahuna, Kaumu, Kawaana, Kiabeluahi, Ihuanu, and all our people are weeping for you. Kule and Nahu are both in Eva. Make your So there's one line in here um, that really, really struck me. It's when Hana runs into Kawi Keoli and John Young. And Kawi Keoli, according to Anna, looks at Ha'ilio's wife. So Ha'ilio and Kawi Keoli grew up together. Um, they went to that first school that Bingham taught, right? They excelled at everything that was thrown at them. Um, Ha'ilio was, I, I would, well, maybe I'm biased because I'm just diving into this story, but I feel like Ha'ilio was one of or if not the most trusted of Kawi Kiyoli's advisors. They grew up together. They, they just knew each other um, really well. So when I, when I read this line that Kawi Kiyoli looked at the wife of the man that he had sent away um, and he just started crying, um, it kind of deepened the, the complexity of the relationships, right? Beyond beyond those narratives that we just see, like, oh, he went from here to here to here to here, right? Um, it multi-dimensionalizes, if that's a word, um, the kind of lived-in spaces that they were operating in, the complexity of it. Um, there's a letter, but I haven't found it yet. There's a letter from Kawi Kyoli to Ha'alilio and he just straight up says, like, you probably aren't going to be coming back from this. Um, so that's one letter. Okay, so going back further a little in time to 1839, a few years before Hannah's letter, when another foreign ship captain named Cyril Laplace threatened the king with the cession of the kingdom, knowledge of the um, Knowledge of the deep and trusting relationship between Ha'aliu and Kawi Kyoli was already well known. So Laplace's problem was that Catholics were being persecuted, right, from his perspective. Um, and Levi Chamberlain, who was one of the early ABCFM missionaries who arrived on the organization's second trip to Hawaii in 1823, and who may also have been present when Ha'alilio was taken as the French captain's hostage. So Ha'alilio was like, 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 oh yeah, take me, like, I'm, you know, I'm gonna be your hostage. Um, he describes Ha'alilio and his relationship with the king in a journal entry dated Wednesday, July 10, 1839. So this is uh, Chamberlain. The king's secretary and one of his favorites was a handsome young man of frank, pleasant countenance and good manners. He wore European dress and spoke English quite well. United in friendship and high, and high standing to the ranks since childhood, Ha'alilio was arguably Kawikyoli's most trusted advisor and friend. His weeping at the sight of Hanabuba in her 1843 letter suggests that Kawikyoli too felt a long separation from his childhood companion. Mm. Perhaps the king felt that he would never see Ha'alilio again. Perhaps he felt a sense of guilt for his friend's separation from his wife and family. Did Kawikyoli's tears also come from the state of his kingdom under the cannon sights of Paulette's ship? 
I was just weeping a mixture of all of the above. Regardless of these speculations and how they can potentially shape our understanding of these moments in history, it is absolutely certain that the archive has not been exhausted. That's my loophole, like I'm not Paul. <laughs> um, Okay, 1842, while Ali Leo and Richards were still on their way to BC via Mexico, another letter is sent to him, dated November 12th, 1842. Written by Jared P. Judd, who at that moment was not officially the kingdom's minister of foreign affairs, but he would be soon. Ali Leo is updated on various financial woes of the kingdom's treasury. Internal hiring, within Kabikyo's cabinet, and a cautionary warning to not purchase any more ships. So while he's doing this, he also has to fulfill his kuleana, right, back home, as part of the council, right? So the more I look at these letters, and I, and I see how kuleana is re being operated, being unfolded across oceans, it makes me like not want to say the word kuleana when I have to do my stuff, like when I gotta take care of my stuff. It 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 almost like multi oh, I think use that word again multi dimensionalizes, right? It, it thickens the meaning of kuleana beyond the English whatever the English equivalent of that is responsibility, okay? Privilege, yes. I don't know, it's probably the translation there. The more I read. Sorry. Ha'alilio um, is updated on various way I read that part. Once these details are listed, Judge Judd relays. So it's Ha'alilio. Plus it's freezing cold and he's getting sick all the time. The climate, right? This is what Judd tells him. o farani ya nuhiva amekaliki. O ikoi. France has taken the Marquesas Islands and Tahiti. Who else remains? Hmm. Every time I, I just gotta get it. Every time I read that, I get chicken skin. Because to be on this mission that's just so important, and then to read that, oh, I'm getting independent, I'm seeking independence recognition for a country that may not even be there when I get like the urgency here is amplified just by these letters that he's getting. How much longer before Hawaii falls under French or British control? Here in this moment, it may be possible to feel a Ha'alilio selflessly devoted to securing his mo'i, to securing what his mo'i has asked him. With another impending approach by French warships towards Kapai Aina, Ha'alilio must have pondered whether or not there would be a Hawaiian kingdom. Judd would write a year later from there, as Hanafuba does, about the lowering of the Hawaiian flag and the raising of British flags, resulting from Kawikyoli's strategic session of the Hawaiian kingdom to Paulette on February 25th, 1843. So two days later, February 27, 1843, a letter is penned by Ha'alilio while he is in London. The letter addressed to Kauka Ame Kauka Wahine, that's Dr. Judd and Mrs. Judd. Living in Honolulu reveals to them his good health and that he's no longer sick as he was in America. He's in London now. He mai ka ino maua, aohe mai ko umai ana noi America. Ua olo lau vau ke ia maulau. We are agreeable to each other, loving and gracious, the we here meaning London. Mm. But, Ha'alilio continues, for the mind to forget the land of my birth, it cannot be forgotten. There is love for land, and the Ali'i and the people. These countries, which I have seen, are great. But I do not want to stay here. Not at all, because the love and desire is not more than what I have for my birthplace. Another part from the same letter. 
e mawahi oi i ke kili o koʻu mau hale, e aku hou i kili ho nā kou kawa mau aina paha te aku. Here is my thought for you. This is him talking to judge. To tear down the thatch of my houses and cover them with new thatch. Maybe the people of our lands ought to thatch it. It will be as you may decide. Watch our houses. This is my wish for you. So his concern, while he's doing all this cooking, huh? his concern for his home engages with the rather overused and often misunderstood meanings of the concept of kuliana. The ability for Ha'adagil to stretch his kuliana ohana across lands and oceans while performing his kuliana oihana, his diplomatic responsibilities in London, while hearing about the session of the kingdom, while being interpolated as Richard's slave on a US steamboat, while experiencing the celebrity that only a distinguished colored man in white circles of power could experience. All of that captures the breadth and depth of the needs of Kuliana, all the multidimensional shapes existing within the limitations of any word before the further limitations of translation take place. And that nullifies the desire to ever use its English equivalent again. Um, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll just read some other, just some short excerpts. So, on December 3rd, 1844, Ali passes away. He was 35, 36. He passes away on the ship called Montreal. Um, prior to that, he had been sick in Massachusetts in the hospital for several weeks, and what we would call today, um, from what we would call today, tuberculosis. But on the ship, he gave his last call to Richards, and Richards recorded it. And this is what Richards said. On the Sabbath day, November 24, 1844, Papa Lilio said to me, I am very weak and may not live to see land again. I asked him if he had any orders for the king. He answered, Yes, I have orders. Tell the king that my great desire is the comfort of my mother. I know it will not, I know it will not do for her to have charge of the lands she being old. I desire that she be given a yearly income, which Kawikyoli did promise and fulfill. My wish in reference to the lands, I have already told the king before I took this trip. He has heard my wish. I have thought of giving my place to Kalayo Kekoi, but I know him to be a bad boy. <laughs> if he was a good boy, I would leave him my place in my estate. But it shall be as the king wishes. My trunks and my other little things shall be for the king. I do not wish them to go to others. The piece of cloth, however, I wish them to go to my mother. If they think they should go to Hana, it shall be as they wish.
slides. So you know how it's. Um, at Unicorn and Student Services. And so um, if you all, when, when many of you students um, decide to transfer over to UH Manoa, you'll be working with Jamaica, with Kuhio, with myself. And so it's a really um, great honor to be here in Maui tonight and get to know some of your faces and talk story with you folks. Um, I'm grateful for this opportunity because it, it forced me to create some space for myself to write down and think a little bit harder about things that I've really been thinking a lot about in the last couple of years as we've you know, witnessed um, such a surge of, of resistance and assertion of who we are um, with Mauna Kea, with Haleakala, with the, with the water issues. But the, the surge of resistance and assertion that we've seen um, throughout the U.S. With, with Native tribes, what we're seeing in Standing Rock, what we've seen in Oak Flats, um, Black Lives Matter, and other movements. And then following last week's election, there's another surge that is taking place. And so these are the things that have been um, uh, inspiring my thoughts around Kuokoa, and it's, it's what I'm gonna talk about tonight. Um, Okoa, Kuokoa, so when you look up Okoa, it's, it's independence, um, but it's also like Holo Okoa, so it's also this idea of, of wholeness or entirety. So that's kind of what I want us to think about tonight when we're thinking about what is, you know, what is Laku Okoa, what is Ku Okoa today, what is its meaning for today. And I'm gonna go <clears throat> in and out of reading a, a way less poetic paper than um, Julio just shared, okay? Um, so Laku Okoa as a national holiday celebrates Hawaiian independence and is marked, we can change the slide, please, nice one. Um, and is marked by the signing of the Anglo-French Proclamation, where Britain and France recognized the independence of the Hawaiian Kingdom and agreed to, and this is quoted from the proclamation, and this is a picture of it right here, right? Agreed to, quote, consider the Sandwich Islands as an independent state and never take possession either directly or under the title of protectorate or under any other form or any part of the territory of which they are composed, unquote. And the way that I just phrased that when I said a second ago, when Britain and France recognized, is often the way that this political agreement is spoken about. <clears throat> we hear things like, we were recognized, Britain and France and later US, the US recognized the Hawaiian Kingdom. The Hawaiian Kingdom was the first non-white nation to be recognized. And this is good because our independence, secured by our lee, is the political foundation. Uh, it's, our, it's our national political history and it's also the political foundation upon which our current grievances rest. But the only issue I take with repeating this phrasing over and over again, that we were recognized, is that it puts all of the activity and agency and power in the hands of the European nations, the colonizing nations. So they recognized us, what did we do? Did we just sit around and wait to be recognized? Um, did, we, did we just wait until they granted recognition? We know that it was much more than this, and thank you to Kuhio for sharing those beautiful stories. It really just brought you know, to the forefront the journey and the work and the kuleana that our lii whole code in order to do this. Um, we know that Timoteo Halidio and William Richards traveled by ship, by donkey, by train, by ship again, meeting with numerous statesmen and diplomats to get them to do something that we had defined 
as needed for ourselves, to get them to recognize our independence, autonomy, and sovereignty in the way that we already did. As Kunkle Kho repeatedly says, before we were an Alpuni, what, anybody? We were a Lahui, yeah. And this Manao is so useful in helping us to think critically about the significance of this holiday, especially in the context of our current struggles over recognition. Pali, Leo, and Richard set out to secure political recognition from colonial powers of the time. Um, so before we were recognized by others, we recognized ourselves. And securing this independence also allowed for us to keep intact institutions of governance that way predated 1843, okay? Um, and, and they knew that they had to do this, as Kuhio said, because they were savvy to the colonialist nature, to the active colonizing that was taking place in the Pacific at that time, right? So there was a real need to do it as well. Um, there was a need to secure our ability to protect our own institutions of governance. Um, okay. So, so that was some of the functions of, of it. Um, but I think it's also important for us to consider that the ways that we as a Lahui had to sacrifice other aspects of who we were to become recognizable in the eyes of Western countries whose own political structures were built upon systems of oppression. And I think that that's also useful for us too when we're thinking critically about the debates over recognition right now is what is it that allows us to be recognizable if we're thinking about federal recognition in the eyes of the US, right? And this is not something that we can just like come up with ideas about, this is something we gotta do our homework about, right? What do native nations and native peoples have to do? What do they have to sacrifice? What do they have to become to even be visible in, in the eyes of the colonial states? So now I'm gonna go through a couple of, um, phrases, terms that may be familiar to some, may not be familiar to some. They're definitely not things we usually talk about with our families, you know, at the dinner table or, or anything like that. They're things that we talk about sometimes in the classroom, but they're things that are useful in helping us to grapple with um, what we went through um, in state formation and, and how that has continued to be something that we've had to grapple with up until now and help us think about how we're gonna grapple it going into our future. Um, so some of these political structures, these, these structures of oppression that we had to tangle with and that did find influence, you know, find their way into the kingdom, um, can, go the, can go to the next slide, were things like private property, um, patriarchy, heterosexuality, and white supremacy. Yeah? Um, so patriarchy is basically a structure of power and rights that privileges um, men at the expense of women. And heterosexuality is a structure of power and rights that privileges a particular relationship over any other kind. Um, and white supremacy, a structure or power, a structure of power and, and rights that privileges whites over non-whites. So the arrows is like kind of like what it leads to, and it's the more kind of normal terms that we that we use, you know, when we're, when we're actually talking about these structures. Um, patriarchy, like when we talk about sexism, often that's embedded in patriarchy. When we talk about homophobia, it's embedded in these kinds of things. Racism, a lot of ra racism is stemmed um, from white supremacy. So securing independence increased our ability to negotiate these institutions, though, of power in the kingdom and keep intact our own institutions of governance. And so I'm gonna go through some examples of that for each of these. So with private property and um, the work of um, Donovan, now I only have you in my mind. Who's the, who's the other Donovan? Donovan Preza, thank you. Um, and his work and, and really diving critically into the Mahele and revisiting the old narrative that Mahele meant we lost all of our lands and all of our rights to lands. So while lands in Hawaii were privatized and substantial acreage sold out to sugar planters, we also know that when the Ali'i were constructing this new system of private property, the Great Mahele, 
They also maintain an inherent right of the people in all lands in the kingdom. Koi na'e ki kuleano ki kanaka is on every land title in the kingdom. And this, this gave us, gave the Maka'i Nana inherent rights, no matter if it, it was privately owned by a sugar planter, whether it was the, the land of the Mo'i or the government. There were, we always maintained inherent rights. And we, we continue to stand upon that today, is the brilliance of that as well. So patriarchy, again, a structure of power and rights that privileges men at the expense of women. Hawaiian women in the kingdom could not vote. Voting as a practice of governance, voting itself was a new institution, as well as determining that such, practice, that such a practice was reserved for men and should exclude women, came from European political philosophy. However, while women couldn't vote, that didn't mean that they didn't vigorously participate in national politics. <clears throat> vigorously and actively participate in national politics. Um, and political independence helped maintain and protect our own political institutions in that our ali'i wahine, or you know, the voting did not also prevent our women, our ali'i wahine, from holding the very highest offices of rule and service in the country, that of the Mo'i, right? So it's this negotiation. We didn't lose everything, but we definitely, some things changed that were kind of not, uh, you know. Okay, heterosexuality. Heterosexuality was preached, disciplined, and shamed into our ancestors in the 19th century. This does not mean that women and men didn't already desire and partner and dwell together. But it does mean that anything outside of that was absolutely out of the question. And loving outside of a Christian church-sanctioned heterosexual marriage could lead to different forms of punishment and criminalization. Um, and, and for me, you know, all of this, of course, we're recovering our history, right? So all of this is still, there's so much more research to be done. And on this particular topic, I can't wait to see what comes out of um, Jamaica's work, because she's looking at this specifically um, for her dissertation. So unlike, unlike private property and patriarchy, I don't know that there was anything in the kingdom law that protected our different ways, that protected our different ways of desiring, loving, and family making. But I do know for our own history books through Mo'olelo, Family Stories, and Mele, that we did it anyways. Yeah, we did not subscribe wholly to heterosexuality. Um, and if you ever hear Jamaica and John Osorio set up the beloved song Sanoi before they perform it, you hear the story of the highest chiefs in the latter part of the 19th century quite openly loving each other as they always had. White supremacy. Um, the research of Dr. Willie Kawai, who's the director of Native Hawaiian Student Services and a recent PhD graduate in political science, and a Maui boy, I wrote down in my notes, oh, yeah. <laughs> argues that racism and white supremacy were held at bay in the kingdom, pointing to the blacks who fled the US and found peace and refuge in Hawaii. Slavery was not legal in Hawaii. And then we also see the story of Ha'alilio, the assumptions, how, how things changed once he stepped foot on US soil. The assumptions that he was the slave and Richards was the master, when it was sort of the other way around. The, when, when people of color, when, when Hawaiians, Kanaka Mali, brown people in the kingdom were not recognized as slaves, we were recognized as citizens, as chiefs, as family, as commoners, yeah. So in those ways, it was held at bay. But there were other things, um, the way that labor was divided and, and laws around labor were divided that did bring race and, and disadvantaged Hawaiians and, and advantaged whites over Hawaiians. And there's a lot more research to be done around that as well. Um, so while independence and okoa provided security in our ability to negotiate these things alongside and with our own values and laws of governance, while these Western institutions were held back to some degree by way of our political independence, a political status, and that's what independence is, it's a, it's a status, a political status, is not a wall that keeps out all the bad things. It's simply something that, that uh, that determines, partially determines the degree to which we can control our own lives, lands, and futures. So these colonial institutions were spreading around the world 
and lived and breathed within her own country through some of the citizens, through the, the, some of the Holly elites and, and missionaries, um, within her own country and definitely outside. So it was, it was sort of trying to push within, right? And it was definitely pushing without. And our independence was this sort of, you know, like perose, if that's the right word, like the holes in the rock, you know, like the lava rocks, the barrier, you know? But we had to do that work to determine like to what degree that stuff would impact us. Um, and so now I kind of want to move to, the point I'm trying to make is that these forces of oppression up here are ever present, yeah? And it's always gonna be our own work that determines to what degree we allow it to define us as a nation, yeah? So independence isn't an end, it's a means, right? Independence doesn't equal poof, all of our problems are gone, we have freedom. You know, independence is a, is a means to secure a little bit more power amongst ourselves to determine how this kind of stuff is gonna operate in our nation. Um, okay. Da, 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 da. Okay, so when we're thinking about regaining our independence, we're compelled to take these forces into consideration. And when working and struggling to do so, okoa, ho okoa, yeah, we got to think holistically about independence. It's not just a legal question. Yeah, it's more than that. It's all of these things. Who are we? What are we going to be? Okay, next slide. Okay, so this is an image that many of you may have seen before, and maybe not, but this is, um, so it's, it's from the cover of this magazine. I, think, I believe it's a U.S. magazine, Judge, and there's a couple other magazines and images that are similar. And it depicts Lili Wolpalani as, in a very racist way, yeah, as this, like, I mean, it's, she's obviously marked as black, so there's already an assumption that blackness is bad, right? It's sort of, it's racist against blacks and it's racist against Lili Wolpalani and Hawaiians. Um, and, yeah, so she's depicted in this really negative, racist way. And so, so as an example of how this follows us, right, if independence allowed us to sort of keep certain things at bay. So when, when the, the elite whites who were tied to money and you know, military circles of the US couldn't achieve what they wanted to achieve because of that independence, they called in U.S. military forces, right? And then they forced it, you know? Um, so one of the issues that they took with Lili Okalani was that she was a woman. One of the issues that she took with Lili Okalani as the highest ruler of this territory was that she was native. So they didn't feel that that belonged in governance, right? We were unfit to govern because we were native. We were unfit to govern because we had this crazy idea that women could rule and be, you know, part of the political participants. So this stuff impacts us and has a huge role in the overthrow as well. Um, and then before you go to the next, but not, not quite yet. So, and then just to kind of drive home that point that it's also today we're still grappling with this. We go to the next slide. Some of you may have heard about this in the news that um, this sort of elite woman, white woman on the East Coast called um, Michelle Obama an ape in heels, yeah. Um, and then the former mayor of that city responded to her tweet and said, you just made my day. Wow. So this has been all in the news, right? But this kind of, um, you know, the, the prevalence of racism, obviously I don't need to preach up here about that, is still all around us, okay? Um, and then go to the next slide, please. And then at the overthrow, so this is a picture of the landing of the um, naval and marine troops um, to ensure the overthrow. And then there's a little picture of some of the community safety members on the bottom. It was done in the name of protecting um, the lives and private property of Americans. Yeah, the lives and property. So private property is um, always this justification for domination and like military police response and takeover of places. Um, can you go to the next slide? 
And then these are just from like the last couple of weeks. So this was two days ago, the Wells Fargo one, and this is in Bismarck, North Dakota. So this is in the context of the Standing Rock struggle. Um, and then of course, um, that other picture is from Standing Rock from like a week or two ago, within the last couple of weeks. And it's this hyper-militarized police force that are there to protect what they consider the private property rights of a corporation um, over that of the native people's sovereign rights, even treaty rights in that area. And then this one was, um, some of the folks have been coming to protest the arrest of one of the water protectors and it's in this vicinity as Wells Fargo, who's one of the funders of the pipeline, and the police are just there, already guarding it. Um, so, so, you know, these images of the troops landing to overthrow the kingdom, and, and it's always in the name of private property. So this is something we got to think critically about too when we're thinking about our future. Um, yeah, the next one, bringing it home. Of course, this is last year on Mauna Kea. And I just love this picture because we have a couple lines of Kanaka, mostly women, doing a genealogical chant in Ula that asserts our relationship to Haloa, Wakea, and Papa, and then you know facing the police for 45 minutes. But this was also in December, just December, a few months after that, the State Land Board approves $53,000 worth of assault rifles for the Department of Land and Natural Resources. So the militarization of the police and the just the increasing police presence when people are asserting their rights is is a way that this continues to follow us and others. Okay, you can go to the next slide. So take a little breather. Oops. Depressing stuff. This picture of stars and, and start thinking about constellations. So, this is moving towards my closing. Um, so, when we're thinking today about Okoa, when we're thinking about independence, and if we can think about it holistically, like I said before, I feel, and this is what I've been thinking about a lot, a lot about lately, we have, to, we have to ask ourselves, like, what role, to what degrees are, do we allow racism? Right, to um, to be a part of who we are, and we do have some, you know, personal soul searching to do. Racism isn't only a, something that other people do, right? There's a huge problem with our local attitudes towards Micronesians, for example, mm -hmm. in Hawaii. So we have to do soul searching, and we have to think about like how do we perpetuate these systems of oppression, also, you know, um, and and. And sexism is another one. You know, sexism is like it's. I forget how my friend put it the other day. It's sexism is always like the first justified, like when you're doing like oppressive behavior. It's always like super, super justified, right? So whether we do it in our language, how we treat boys and girls differently, um, not to preach on like any of that stuff, but just to just to say that these are things that we need to think about critically when we're thinking about independence and our future. And the ways that these things overlap. So I'm gonna give some examples of how people are taking their thing, you know, so like maybe our thing is like sovereignty, our thing is Hawaiian issues, and they're starting to link arms with other people who have different things because they see how these things overlap. And so that's why this picture, because you start to link up these stars and you can think of it as like constellations, right? So this is a way that I think we can um, find hope and especially where people are feeling like so hopeless in the past week, so extra hopeless, find hope and strength and power. Um, okay, next slide. Okay, so there's a lot of both slides. So on the right is from um, Black Lives Matter's own website and they just came out with it very recently that they, it was their official position that they stand in solidarity with the water protectors at Standing Rock. So this is a black, uh, black power, black rights movement saying, hey, indigeneity and indigenous rights and water protectors rights and these things are also critical to our issues. They overlap, they're the same, and we need to kind of come together to build power and push back against these forces that we're up against. And then the other one on the left, affirm 
is a transnational like feminist women's movement group, and there's a local Hawaii chapter that is being run by Kamiela Ng's Wahine, um, Kara, and they also came out. So this is the women's movement saying indigenous issues are important and we stand with them. Okay, next one, please. Now we have a couple examples of um, what, we, what we think of as indigenous movements or black movements saying that, hey, gender is particularly important. We can't just assume that if we're going for indigenous rights, that gender is an automatic thing that we don't gotta deal with. Or we can't assume that if we're saying black lives matter, um, that every black life, women's black lives, are being treated with as, the same kind of value as black men's lives. So Say Her Name is a campaign that's in response to, um, you know, in the Black Lives Matter movement, it's mostly black men that we see the stories of being, you know, assaulted or killed by police, when black women are being assaulted and killed by police every day as well. So in these movements, we think we got our thing, and sometimes we don't realize that we're erasing and marginalizing entire you know, groups of people within our movements. And then missing and murdered indigenous women, that's another, like, it's a huge problem. It's happening in Canada, the US, and so now there's a particular focus. So this is indigenous struggle, black struggle, and they're saying gender is important within that. Um, and then this is like Black Lives Matter, one of their one of their values. We're committed to building a black woman affirming space, free of sexism, misogyny, and male centeredness. And to tell you the truth, those things got to be articulated. They can't be assumed. Um, okay, next one. Please. So this is um, Midwest Queer Indigenous People of Color Conference. So this is just a quick kind of visual to show that like all these different things coming together and trying to link up and build power together and recognizing that these systems of oppression hurt us all. Um, and then next one. And then this is, I'm um, bringing it home again, this is like inter-Pacific uh, Oceanic Solidarity. So the picture on the right is of a group called um, Oceania Interrupted, and they're Maori women. Um, and they did this action in Aotearoa um, in, to, to bring to light the issues, the genocide that's taking place in West Papua. And then the, the picture on the left was an action um, blocking ships in Australia coming into a particular port that were carrying oil. Um, and this is different Pacific nations coming together and fighting climate change together. And then the next one, the last one. Um, so then this is um, also bringing it home last, this past summer, um, you know, there was like some shootings going on in the U.S. and Black Lives Matter was really like on the minds and the, and the grief that the black, you know, community were going through, Ameri um, African American community was going through, there was some solidarity building that started to happen in Hawaii. And so there was a whole event around the theme Black Lives Matter in the Hawaiian Kingdom. How's that one? So it, it's talking about Black Lives Matter and it's also affirming our sovereignty, yeah? Black Lives Matter and Hawaiian Kingdom. That's the work of trying, starting to define what does the Hawaiian Kingdom mean? What is independence? And then this is just a, a great picture of our friend Joy Enamoto, who is from Maui. She's Kanaka Maui and she's black. And she gave a really impassioned speech at, um, uh, at La Hoi Ea. Right, so our other big national holidays. We're talking about hoi hoi ea. We gotta talk about these these things. And I love, I love, I even you know put in the um, where she said, speaking truth to power. Mahalo haumene ke trask for giving me the strength to talk about why Black Lives Matter in the Hawaiian Kingdom. Um, and so we know, and Kumukaleko talks about this a lot that. Even our own sovereignty movement has been informed by the struggles of other people around us. Um, so I guess in closing, it's just to bring home the idea that we have to, um, now is a good time. I think if we want to start recommitting, especially as everybody's kind of freaking out after last week's election, it's like maybe pick one thing that's not your usual thing and pay attention to it. You don't, we're not all responsible for all of everybody's issues in the world, and of course, we barely have time to wobble the kuleana of our own Hawaiian issues, right? But maybe pick one thing and, and talk to one person that you know in your circle that that's their thing, that's different than your thing, 
and and make a little bit of a commitment to study it, you know, to study what it means, how they talk about it, the way that we talk about Hawaiian issues, and maybe make a commitment to show up, to show up to one of their actions and ask them to commit to show up to one of ours. Um, so I'll just close with this. Uh, this is, it's one of my favorite quotes from Tayaki Alfred from this book of his. He's a Mohawk uh, activist and scholar. He says, how you fight determines who you will become when the battle is over. And there is always means and consistency at the end of the game. Let's leave it at that. Mahalo. Vilina and I may kill on here again. Aloha. Oh, me, oh, great core, and keep you papa no in the key of Okuni or Maui. Mahalo, we wow, Yoko Pau. Pelaku to put Nane, okay, and keep Papahana, and Kahelima, Jamaica. Aloha. Aloha. I guess I'm going to freestyle a little bit. I'm just going to just speak off the top of my head, kind of reaction. I just like the first act, you know. Donovan and sharing uh, to me, which is probably going to be oh, thank you, Mom. Uh, will become uh, one of the more important stories in Mo'olelo for our people to understand. Really, we talk about Timoteo Aliyo, uh, and I know just you know the basics of his story. But even if it's just the basics of his story, I'm already excited to see the kind of scholarship that's coming out, that's been coming out the last 20 years. And really when you look in the next five years, uh, I mean, there's gonna be a lot of great stuff be coming out. And, you know, I think your work with uh, Holly Liu, I think really shed some light out. And for me, uh, for us to really understand, when we talk about Hawaii independence, and you talk about what happened in our history, To understand the sacrifices that were given by our kupuna, it wasn't just by a whim, just by chance, our people, our kupuna were able to attain and achieve at a particular, you know, really at a particular time. When you go into the world history, in the 1840s, I mean, you think Trump land is racist today. I think about what it was like in the 1840s. And even though they had those kinds of barriers, really, at a time when only European white nations were recognized, only, that's it, this little Hawaiian kingdom, small islands in the middle of the Pacific, were able to figure out a way to make it across as the journey was being shared all the way, eventually, you know, visiting President Tyler in 1842, they're going across to Europe. And even, that's a long story, I mean, to manipulate the situation, Europe and playing, using our worldview to understand, to get to that person, I go talk to her friend and his cousin and stuff and work your way there. And that's what they did. You know, John Simpson, Will Richards, Timothy Hallelujah, really accomplished, when you think about world history, it's really amazing what they were able to accomplish. And these were accomplished in the highest understanding of the word. And it's really sad that 99% of our people really don't understand the history. But you see, as an educator, I know the day will come when most of our people will know the story. And that's why for me, uh, when you think about people like Ali, 
And understanding the sacrifice when he didn't come home. And you can tell part of him knew he wasn't going to come home. Part of our people knew back here he probably won't come home either. But he knew what had to be done. Now why was it done? What well, exactly is going to share? What happens in 1843 early on with Lord Paulette? But even prior to that, as we share also, we gotta understand, when you look at Hawaii, we gotta understand what's going on in the rest of the Pacific. In 1841, you know, the French take Tahiti. <coughs> the Treaty of Waitangi in 1842. I think Marquesis Nukuhiva is taken at the same time. Samoa, the Germans are in Samoa. And when you really understand history, and you look at the Pacific, this wide, white Pacific. Here we are, in the middle here. Really, the whole Pacific, it was really only Arkupuna who achieved that recognition, which is astounding. It's astounding because in world history, before there was a China that was recognized, the Vietnam, any of the African states, any of the other Asian states, none of the other Pacific peoples. It was us, our kupuna, who were able to achieve this monumental, monumental recognition. And I really don't think most of our people really understand that. You see, that's the thing. Because if you truly understood what they achieved, and if you truly understood what people like Paul, you know, gave, gave, so that we, one day, will be able to come or re-flourish as a people, then we would really appreciate and not really think so lightly, perhaps, of those kinds of political issues that we deal with today. You see, for me, it's hard to swallow, and I'll bring it to the context of today. When people talk about federal recognition, they talk about the Department of Interior, and they talk about this kind of language as if, well, let's go pretend that we're, we're gonna be uh, it's kind of non-recognized history. We'll be incorporated like an Indian tribe. In this particular history that's American history. You can only do that if one, you don't know your history, or two, you don't value the history of your people. That's the only way. Because you can't truly understand all this and then go say, yeah, I'm gonna give all that up and just pretend that none of it occurred. And see, as, as I describe myself, when I look at our history, even in the 1840s, we can go look. Oh, son of a gun. Oh, here we go, plenty of hands over here. Thank you. Stop it. Captain, Captain Chu, Captain Cook. <laughs> right? There is a debate among some people about exactly how many of our kupuna were on these islands. You know, the low number is 400K, that's Captain King. Many people today go up to a million. Well, I like to use 800,000. That's in 1778. 1778. But 1820, I'm sorry, 1827. 27, 25. Oh, my brain is going already. Roughly about 187,000. By the 1850s, we're down to 80,000. 80 to 90, we're down to 40,000. And I check, if I remember right, I think 1910 was it. We're down to about 29,000 or 30,000. That tells us, by 1890, you're talking, if we're lucky, we're talking one in 10. If you're 800,000, we're talking one in 20. So I guess look at this room right here. And if I say there are 40 people here, 40 people that were here in 1778, how many would now be left? This is some algebra. <laughs> how many of you guys would be left? Just, Two. Just a so let's look about here. 
1770, this is us. 1890, that's it. That is part of the story. We gotta understand. So that's why when I, when I, when I talk to young boys, I always tell you, know, our lives are not cheap. You know why? Your lives are not cheap. Because, as you say, koi no na kua. Hua pao, hua halala, koa, koi no na kua. And from that too, comes all of us. And so part of what is going on here when I look at that history is survival. So when I think about things like Kuo, Koa, we have to understand part of this history. You know, 1810, of course, coming out there, unites the islands. Prior to that, in 1792, of course, Maui loses our sovereignty to Hawaiian Island when Kamehameha comes and wipes out many of our kupuna up in Iao. By 1810, Kauai ceded, islands come under one so-called kingdom. 1839, it was talked about. First Declaration of Rights. 1840, the first Hawaiian Constitution. And we don't realize when it comes to constitution, that's pretty early. And then when you start looking at non-whites and non-Europeans, we're at first. And also in 1840, just to add as what the Ilimo is sharing, so you gotta understand, yes, women did not vote, but yet we know there was Keka Olohi, for example, who signed the first constitution. It was a woman in 1840 that signed the first constitution. Representing the elite. It's the Kohima Nui. Trump plan to this day, we're still figuring out if we could even handle uh, Wahine as a uh, president. <laughs> Point being for us to understand as part of our history, we do not come from a backwards people. We don't come from a people that wasn't aside just waiting to figure out, gee, I wonder if we could govern ourselves as Hawaiians today. See, so this is part of our history. Now, we've come to that conclusion today for many of our people, and that's because not so much as a lack of education, but really for purposeful miseducation of our people. We gotta understand that there's a reason why all of us don't know the story of Ha'aliliu. And the reason, of course, is that if we really understood those stories, if we really understood these stories, if we really understood what happens in 1843 in the securing of our independence, see, we think different. You start not to talk about independence as something we're looking to pursue, something maybe one day we'll have, but something, in fact, that we secured back in 1843. It's a totally different way of looking at the world. We're not looking at the United States, I hope one day we can be like you guys. <laughs> We already understand at one time, at one time, we are recognized as co-equals. That's a fact. Sadly, that's a fact that was erased from most of our memories. So our grandparents and our parents grew up at a time that disconnected it from their grandparents who knew all of this. This was purposely done to the educational system, number one to teach us fibs, and so when you look at La Kuokoa, and some of my other class know when I talk about Thanksgiving, and when you kind of, when I giggle about the history, they took La Kuokoa, November 28, 1843, which was our national holiday, which has a particular meaning on the grand scale, not just for Kanaka, but when you think about world history, you're talking about any other people of color that came after us to gain their their, their uh, recognition. They came after us. So we were the ones, as they would say, broke the glass ceiling. That's our kubuna. This is something we should be proud of. This is something we should ensure that all our students understand this. We should all have copies of this recognition. But we should also recognize that although we had this in 1843, 
Sadly, as we know, in, in 18, sorry, 1893, this was snatched away from us. This was snatched away from us via a military regime's move to take control of these islands. Not because it brought some sense of greater humanity for the people of Hawaii. Not because they're going to give us more democratic rights. But really only because of military necessity and the use of these islands like Pearl Harbor for the expansion of what became the U.S. Empire with the Spanish-American War of 1898 and so on. So I think about Thanksgiving, going back to this, I knew I forgot something. <laughs> this is our national holiday. Our Independence Day, the most important date in the Hawaiian Kingdom that was secured by Ha'alilio, who gave his life to secure this. With much love. And it's interesting when you read some of those other kupuna like Ha'alilio and others who travel, when they traveled the world, they always knew Hawaii was better. And that's something I love. It wasn't like, they went out there, wow, this is pretty cool, man. Paris is nice, London is cool, but man, I wish I could go home sometime. <laughs> See, they knew what we had here. That's the point. And I always tell my friends, you know, don't think about you gotta move to California, go Beverly Hills, make you millions and ten million dollars, and then when you retire, where are you gonna retire? They come back home over here. You're already here at the end zone, you see. We are at the end zone. Why do you think all the multi-millionaires and millionaires come here? Because we are here. So you got to understand, we got to wake up to be here. To understand who we are here. We are here. We're lucky to be here. We're fortunate to be here. We are blessed to be here. And our kupuna understood that. And then what happens after the overthrow? During the Republic of Hawaii, I mean, 1896, I think it was. Well, eventually this, this becomes illegal to get rid of this holiday. And what are they going to give us? <laughs> well, they want to give us Thanksgiving. <laughs> and of course, we all know the story of Squanto and Pocahontas and all those stories, made famous by Disney. But Thanksgiving, if you understand the history of Thanksgiving itself, my students know I teach in my class, you really realize that Thanksgiving you didn't talk had nothing to do with the actual events that happened in the early 1600s with the coming of what's called the All Saints, who later become known as the Pilgrims. And I was telling this story, when the Pilgrims first arrived on so-called Plymouth Rock, What's the first thing they did when they stepped ashore? Well, the first thing they did was pray. pray. <coughs> what was the second thing they did when they came ashore? Claim. Huh? They claimed it. Claim it. What else they do? I'll mess with this, remember this. <laughs> What's the first thing they did when they came upon this burn of sand? <laughs> After they claimed them, <laughs> what did they find? They came upon an Indian burial site. And the first activity they did was not to go plant seeds in the ground, but to dig up the burials in Great Rock. You just understand this. That's the pilgrims. That's the, that's the holiday they gave us instead. And of course, you know the pilgrims, as I was telling us, the first year, about half of them died in the first winter. They weren't eating pumpkin pie and pie and turkey. <laughs> How do you think the other half survived? <laughs> it's called cannibalism. I don't see them telling you that in their history books. <laughs> they give you the Indians and uh, pilgrims sat together, ate turkey, and everybody was happy. But it's not true at all. The following summer, the spring, I should say, the Indians from that area, the Pequots, and others came, taught them how to fish, taught them how to plant to survive. They felt so pity of these guys. <laughs> Saved their lives. 20 years later, 
Yeah, my, my date, my royal touch. I get 1625 in my head, but that might be wrong. You can look up people like William Bradford and others who write about what they did. And William Bradford gives us first Thanksgiving message. And the first Thanksgiving message, what you have to hear this, had to do with the massacre of the Peacocks. Where over 600 of them were murdered. Not just murdered, but were burnt alive. <coughs> and the Thanksgiving message was saying, Thank God! The smelling scent of the fiery dirt bodies. We can glory to God with them. This is, this is not Kali Ko's verses, I'm saying. This is things you should understand. So we think about Thanksgiving, what do you have to understand that? I'm not saying we shouldn't give thanks. That's really the true message, supposedly, of Thanksgiving. But we should not be fooled in regards to that Disneyland, Hollywood story of somehow why we should celebrate some kind of Thanksgiving because, man, thank God for those pilgrims who came out and shared some thank, uh, turkey and uh, pumpkin pie with the Indians. It had nothing to do with that. See, for me, this is our holiday. That's our holiday, right here. That's the true holiday. And the point I'm trying to get at, when you think about kuwa kuwa to me, that was really to stand in whole or stand apart, stand different, ku o koa. And one thing that I would say with that is that, for me, and my friends know sometimes they get mad when I say this, but I say, I'm not for Hawaiian independence as much as I'm for independent Hawaiians. And you gotta understand the difference. I think that's what Ilima is talking about. And I always say, you can give us an independent nation with a passport. Right now, right today. Hawaiians, you're independent. Oh, damn. As I say, we are sick people. We have been tainted with white supremacy. We have been infiltrated with sexism. We have been destroyed with capitalism in our brains. See, my point is, we gotta, it's not just about Hawaiian independence in a political sense we should be thinking about, which is part of the story. But if we're not looking to think for ourselves, to feed ourselves, to sustain ourselves, to be healthy for ourselves, to educate ourselves, we're really not talking about independence, you see, that's the point. Because if our minds, hearts, and soul are still being controlled by the ideas of others, especially the ideas of those who want to continue to exploit us, we're not free. And for me, the biggest lesson has always been this. In order to be independent as Hawaiians and thinking, see, that's why it's important that we do our own research, that we define for ourselves, not just our history, but define for ourselves our future. And hence, bring it to, you know, modern issues of today. That's why I refuse, and many of you guys know my stance at, at basic premise, I refuse to accept that Governor Abercrombie in 2011, had a right to create what's called Act 195 to set up what became the Kanayo Lovalo Road Commission. Who the hell is Abercrombie to decide for us, to create for us? And then when you understand the same situation as I, I said many times, that same Abercrombie in the same year said to the world, I give Mauna Kea to the world. As I have been said, who the fuck is him to give Mauna Kea to the world? <laughs> And then yet, we don't look and say, yeah, that's a good idea, Dr. Abercrombie, yeah, you know what you're doing. So the fundamentals, and my point, the fundamentals, if we cannot define for ourselves how to and when to and what to do, that is the fundamental kernel of Kuo See, sovereignty and is not something anybody can give us. That's not something anybody can give us. Especially as you put in a power structure. As I always say, the oppressor will never free the oppressed. The dominator 
will never tell the Dhammani how to sell end this domination because there's privilege. There's benefit benefits from this. In fact, what they're going to do is try to manipulate and confine a way to control that situation in regards to what, what kind of options you may have. You know, of course, you can look at Elijah Muhammad's example, look at the slave master and the slave. There's a reason why the slave master never allowed the slave to learn to read and write. To be educated. Why? Because education was the key to their freedom. See, once you see yourself as an educated person, once you know something is wrong about this situation, it's human instinct to go and fight and figure out ways to end that situation. However, if you've been not educated, but if you've been trained to accept that situation, you've been taught to believe that's all you can get, that's all you can be, and that's all you are. I don't know none of this stuff here. <laughs> then you can be manipulated into a situation which keeps intact that power structure. See, that's the goal. And so if you understand, looking again like in, a, in, a, in the structure of a, a, a slave plantation, it don't matter how nice your master can act to be. He can be the sweetest master in the world. But think the situation what's going on today in Hawaii and other parts of the world. And we can look at the reactionary politics in this, like what I call America now, Trump land. Because, you know, people are so surprised by Trump, and I'm like, what are you surprised about? Trump is America. Trump isn't something that's, oh my God, special, that just happened oh, by chance it occurred. No. Trump is America. What do you guys understand it? And for me, I don't want to have nothing to do with Trump land. <laughs> Especially when I stand in Trump land, Trump land, he believes that the so-called slavery system is still a pretty good system. <laughs> and so when I look at today, we talk about Kuko in the same, in the same, in the same way. We got that's why it's so important for us. And that's why when I look at the liberation, liberation will occur through our education. We will never be liberated when we are uneducated. So you gotta let us end that. The first step to a liberation is our own education. Once you know, and you can look at people like Nat Turner, as radical as he was, of course, with Nat Turner, so-called prophet from God, God told him, kill your master, and that's what he did. <laughs> Meaning, once he realized there's nothing, nothing legal about being a slave, I mean, what do you think about that? Is there any law that a slave owner could have to justify owning a slave? See, very much in the same way when I look at Hawaiians, is there any law that any other country in the world could have morally, legally, have to say that we know what's better for you, Hawaiians? See, for me, from the fundamentals, it's a pretty simple answer for me. So I don't get caught up in that kind of craziness. Because to me, that's all part of the manipulation. To start to play and, and, and play in this game somehow to think that maybe if we behave pretty good and we follow the laws and we do things, you know, maybe one day you'll be nice to us and they're going to let us free. Well, as someone who studies history, I will tell you, freedom has never been gained by the oppressed, by just hanging around and being nice to the oppressor. It has never worked that way in history. At all levels, the oppressed must first recognize who they are. And that recognition, and that's why I, I love exactly what you must say, that recognition is not something that anybody else can give us. Recognition first starts with this. We gotta recognize, as I said, we didn't start being a people in 1843. And if you go from the Kumulipo and you start from Paul, we began from when the cosmos began. We began from Lucky Lucky. We began from Haloa. 
I said, I am that I am, I am, I am, I am. I am the whole Puna of Haloa. You cannot move me. No can, no ways. When you know who you are, see that's the point. When you know who you are, you cannot sell me John Washington. You cannot sell me Abraham Lincoln. You cannot sell me Thomas Jefferson. You cannot sell me Thanksgiving. See, that's the point of education for me. So when I think of Kuo Kua, fundamental, I also think fundamentals. It's recognition, first of all, who we are. Who was our true self? How have we been manipulated even into this situation? How have we been miseducated, assimilated, Americanized, colonized, destroyed inside and out? How has it occurred? And what you will find, the number one culprit is the educational system, which tells me, how do we end this miseducation? But we must control our own education. You see, that's the point. And luckily, we get some scholars like these guys out there who are turning the information, who are turning this education. Because liberation for our people, the liberation of our people starts with the liberation of our minds. My good friend, Kwai Puna PG, used to say, you know, it's a change in our brains, the ones we gotta worry about. And I added the idea, you know, people get confused about worrying about the change in our legs. But it's really the change in our brains. Because as long as you get the change in your brain, you don't even recognize the change on your leg. You think the change is supposed to be there all the time. In fact, sometimes it might confuse you to be there, it's good for you. But see, if you got the chains off your brain, even with the chains on the leg, man, you be trying to figure out all kinds of ways to get out that chain. See, that's the important part of the mind. You know, this consciences, conscientism, this sense of raising consciousness to become awake, to become aware. That is the fundamental key. What I always tell my students is that every day learn something new. Even the most mind, I mean, and I always tell people, oh, I like Kuma, I like learning language. They go word every day. One word a day. One sentence a day. One concept a day. One historical fact a day. Teach it to a friend. Teach it to a class. And this is how we change. This is nation building. Nation building for me, we're going to say the remembering, reawakening. But you see, you get people telling us, guys, hey, sign your name on the paper and we, 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 we just go to that door. What's behind the door? I don't know, but get the paper. <laughs> and that's the mentality that's out there. See, I'm the one go, oh, who's saying go run through that door? See, that's how our kupuna taught too. Our kupuna went that way, but go do this, so yeah, go do it. Oh, you go first. <laughs> but you see, if people have been miseducated, uneducated, or robbed of their identity, or become uh, strangers to their own history. And they believe, oh man, Thomas Jefferson was a cool guy, and George Washington, let's go do, you see, you can quickly become caught up. As they say, when, hey, yeah, you say, you say, stuck in the net. And you cannot see outside that net. And so when they say, well, put your name here, oh yeah, put my name there. And for my, for my, you know, quick analysis of the situation for Hawaiians today, that's the last thing we should be thinking about. The most important step is the clearing and raising of our consciousness, the education of all of our people. That's the most fundamental. People say, come on, how are we going to become independent again? I said, well, I don't know the answer. I can't answer to that question, but I know what's required. And I would say, two things are required. One, you gotta be educated. And when I mean educated, I'm not talking about you gotta get necessarily a degree from the university kind of education. You gotta understand your own self, your own history, your own people, your own land. And two, you gotta get three things. Two, <laughs> we need unity. But unity can never occur between the oppressor and the oppressed. Oh, they're two Ps, eh? Who has to 
unified. We have to unify. You think they're unified? Of course they're unified. So when Hawaiians think, oh, no, we gotta unify and no, oh, uh, we gotta unify with Abercrombie and you know Ike and all those guys. See, you already lost the battle. Our disunity, our disunity is based upon our refusal to acknowledge that the oppressor can never have unity with the oppressed. And I'm not saying we cannot love them or give them aloha. My point is, when we organize and we struggle and we fight, we gotta understand there's a difference here. This is basic one-on-one -on -one political science. But the trick is, and this is the trick that the oppressor used, is they'll take some of our so-called people from the oppressed, and they move more to their side. And now where's the disunity? Amongst us. And that's my point when I was saying how I don't understand how you can understand this history and acknowledge and be thankful for the works of our kupuna. And then just ignore all of that and thank Abercrombie and those in and say we're going to do what they want us to do. To me it makes no sense. So we look at you better give me the eye on the already so. Three things. The, the last thing last I'm just going to add, which is tied into this, is tied into recognition, which is again the foundation of Kuokua. If we as Kanaka cannot recognize ourselves, there's no way you can stand, or we can stand as ourselves. That's the bottom line. That's the fundamental bottom line. And a kupuna had a saying. But this is the more common one. E ike ika ho kanaka. O kipa yeva ki aloha. Ika ilio. O leo no eo. Wa ya kuuna. E ike. See. Know. Recognize. Your fellow. Kanaka. O kipa yeva. Less. Or else. Bye bye. Your love will be wasted upon the dog. And really what it's meaning fundamentally is that we as Kanaka, we got to see and understand ourselves. Less, we say paying attention to what somebody else wants, you see. But somebody, for the benefit of somebody else. And to me, this is such a fundamental benefit that when we talk, we organize, we educate, we speak, we must always remember that our attention first has to be to our fellows, our fellow Kanaka. And not worry about what they think. Or how it affects them, or you know, how they make. See, that's the bottom line. And this is the wise words of our kupuna. Ika ilio. And this is the wise words of our kupuna. So before we look at the ideal like Abercrombie, who must unify? Who must struggle together? In fact, I was the third one, I forgot. Struggle. Who needs to struggle? We need to struggle first. And how are we gonna get that? Is that we gotta be able to see and to know ourselves first. And so that's why, you know, again, China I this too, and I think with Ilima's also, the Ilima's basically trying to share, is that we talk about political independence and la kuokoa, we gotta understand, yes, it's a very important, necessary step and part of the process, and it's something important to look at and understand. But if we don't address or pay attention 
or heed those other questions about who we are as a Kanaka. Like, why are we sovereign? If you look at an example of us from, uh, you know, as Hanani uh, uh, King Trask used to say, you know, Aina doesn't mean real estate. I want you guys to think about it. It's the fundamental. That's Aina. Aina does not mean real estate. So if, if we're talking about Hawaii independence and we look at our lands and we say, oh, those are beautiful properties and real estate, what has already happened? We screwed. <laughs> We become like the masters themselves. Think like them, behave like them. So we've been trained well, act like them. Instead, we must go back and look at, in fact, Kwame Turi has a famous saying, and he says, the answers can only come from our culture. Our culture naturally resists. It's a culture that naturally resists this foreign uh, uh, desire to control our people and our resources. And what fights against that is our culture. I'm not talking culture, just throw some Hawaiian words, put the Aloha shirt, sing Kanaka Bye Bye, as my friend um, Paul would say. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about from the core, understanding that meaning like I am so I'm go. You talk about culture. Culture meaning another was food for what I what I do. Right, what you know, yeah. Now, as a culture, how can we protect our culture when law enforcement comes in and not understand our culture? Yeah. That was the third one I had, which I mentioned, which is struggle. I, I'm a fisherman. I know how to fish. Somebody, because they have a bag, they're not a fisherman. And they come and tell me, I eat evil. I went with my kukuna and they taught me how. Now I do it, but they taught me how. And this guy, He's my son's schoolmate, and now he's the chief of the fishing department on Maui. I taught him how to fish. <laughs> now he turned around and tell me, I am evil. This is our culture meaning the reinforcement people the policeman, whatever, can be take what is our culture or how we how how do we go out and gather. This is what what the whole folks brought up. And if we lose that, my God, if we lose everything. I thank you. No, but that's the bottom line. See the point is, see that's the point. It's because of his cultural knowledge. He never just go, oh, okay. No. Thank you very much. Yeah. You see? It's because the culture, like I said, the culture is the foundation to our resistance. When you look up, and I've seen uh, Sintiari over there, and I saw Mikiala there earlier, but for example, we can look at Iao, it has another context that's going on right now, I'm out. If you don't have a sense of saying, of putting value to your culture, understanding of meaning, then you will look up there and go, oh yeah, pretty good job you're doing up there. And the mayor says, it's, it's good, so I guess it's good. But you see, once you get tainted, and I put that word, once you get tainted with this identity of culture, there's no stopping. And so that's for me, fundamentals are exactly what Uncle is saying. If we don't even have that within ourselves, we will accept what they tell us, what is right or wrong. But if we can implant or replant 
the seeds of our culture within our, our bodies and within our families, we cannot help but to resist and to struggle. Because once you understand that's who truly we are, you will do whatever is necessary to guarantee. Now, it doesn't mean you will win all the time, but it means people will stand and struggle. When you look at Mount Akil, Mount Akil wasn't about, gee, I wonder how much money we should get from these telescopes up there. See, that's when you sit down the road. It's sad to say, some of our Hawaiians, that's how they were thinking, mentioning the Office of Hawaiian Affairs. <laughs> Just to tell the truth. Let's be clear, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs do not support we who struggle against the TNT. I want you guys to understand that. There are trustees, and thank God the one on Maui supports us, Uhuru. But there's six of them on that board that don't. They're thinking about the revenues and future negotiations. But the point I'm trying to say, see, that's the key. Exactly, that's the key. That's why even things like language was so powerful. Why do you think in 1895 did they ban the Hawaiian language from education? Because it sounded funny? <laughs> no, they understood. Again, they understood the means to control is to destroy the sense of the Ike. And if you can destroy the Ike, you gain control. You can manipulate. You can do whatever can be done. See, that's why when you look at the DUI hearing just every two years ago, when the DUI came, they got their asses kicked by the community. Why? Because the community over and over and over was speaking the true history. People were coming up and going, oh, I wonder what the DUI can do for us in this. The people came up, oh, because people knew the history. Once people start to know, people start to exercise in their way. See, that's the point. And that's why going back to me, the foundation of teaching and education, when you teach your mo'opuna or family, in fact, I should, my old Jocelyn that this, sorry, Jocelyn, if you guys have any questions or information you want to share about the uh, Kuei petition, you'll see Jocelyn that there. But that's another example, 18, in 1897. In 1897, you want to talk unity, you want to talk, did our people know who we were back then? Did they know, did they know our history? Forget about Thanksgiving, but our history. Of course they do. And that's why they sign. So if you are confused, but I wonder what our kupuna were thinking. It's not a matter of I wonder anymore. Because of our education, we know today. There is no confusion. Confusion comes when you don't know. And so I, I'm gonna stop there. Ma Mahalo and I don't know if you have any questions or maybe Jamaica can, can share with us uh, another uh, right? okay. I think people are waiting for you, Jamaica. We went over time, which means we don't really have time to open it up for questions. But I do encourage you to uh, stop these people in their tracks to ask them any questions or have conversations with them, and hopefully we can continue to have these conversations um, together. But I want to thank you guys all for coming out tonight. Um, good, 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 good poetry. I don't even know anymore, Paul. Oh, so. oh. Um, no, it's really on the spot. I can't. Eight-minute poem. All right. People want to eat it for more. Okay. We'll do one poem and then we'll all go home. Aren't you guys tired? No. Yeah, I'm tired. Um, I'll do this poem because it's relevant to what Kalei just said. My apologies for those of you who might have already heard me do this poem today. Um, it's just relevant. I'm running out of Hawaiian poems, um, which is a really sad statement. Um, better, 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 better. All right, all right, all right. What happens to the ones forgotten? The ones who shaped our hearts from their rib cages. I want to taste the tears in their names. Trace their souls onto my vocal cords so that I can feel related again because I, I have forgotten my father's own grandparents' middle names. Forgotten what color thread the gods used to sew me together with because there is a culture, a people, somewhere beneath my skin that I've been searching for since I left because it's hard to feel sometimes because at Stanford, I was taught to be innovative. The city of Macintosh reads thinkers of tomorrow, so I have forgotten how to remember, but our roots cannot remember themselves. We'll not remember how to dance unless we are chanting for them and will not sing unless we are listening, but our tongues, they feel too foreign in our own mouths. We don't dare speak out loud. So we can't even pronounce our own parents' names and who will care to remember mine if I don't teach them. 
I want to teach my future children how to spell family with my middle name, Heoli Melia Kalani, how to feel love with Kamakko Viva Ole, how to taste the culture and the Kumulipo. Please do not forget me. My father who could not forget his own, Le Aloha, do not forget what's left because this is precisely all that we have. And you won't find your roots online. We have no dances or chants if we have no history, just rants. No roots, just tears. This is all I have of my family history that's real and now it's yours. Oh, Charles Moses, come up with Olehekane, oh, Daisy Kelly, I of Ava Kabahine, no Pulawa, Aha, no Eo, or Liza, Lelo, or come up with Olehekane, or Liza, Lelo, or come up with Olehekane, or come up with Olehekane, or Mio Montero, or Zorehekane, no Pulawa, Aha, no Eo, Elroy, Thomas, say Aloha, or Zorehekane, or Elroy, Thomas, say Aloha, or Zorehekane, or Clara, Kule, K, Havahine, no Pulawa, Aha, no Eo, or Jonathan, K, come up with Ole, or Zorehekane, or Jonathan, K, come up with Ole, or Zorehekane, or Mary, Carol, Dunn, Havahine, no Pulawa, Aha no io o Jamaica, Heoli Meli Kalani o Zoyo Hebahine, do not forget us, my boy. Have a beautiful night, guys. Yay! Yay!